It's been almost three months since the Niner RIP E9 first landed in my garage. This is a demo sent to me from Niner. I've made a lot of other videos on this bike, but in this video, I'm going to review it just like I do my normal bike reviews. If you've not watched the other videos that I've made on this bike, this is the first e-bike that I've ever had in my fleet. But when I do this review, I'm not gonna talk about kind of how it compares to a traditional bike in my experience riding the e-bike. I'm just gonna focus on the bike itself. Before I talk about how the bike rides, I wanna go over the frame and the components. So this is Niner's first e-bike that they've come out with. Since then, they put out the WFO, which has longer travel. This bike has 160 mil travel in the front and 150 in the rear. It's an alloy frame. Like I said in one of my other videos, I think it was a pretty smart move by Niner to come out with an alloy frame first to kind of test the waters of the e-bike. And since it does have a motor, you don't need a bike that's super light. Again, I'll talk about how the bike rides coming up, but I did not miss a carbon frame on this bike just because you get so much power from the Bosch motor. But let's look at some of the components, starting with the fork. So the fork is a RockShox Yari. Like I said, 160 mil travel. And I was actually really impressed with how smooth this fork felt. It's not the highest end RockShox, and most of my other bikes I use Fox suspension. But this fork remained remarkably smooth the entire test period of riding the bike. On the left side is where you add your air, and then on the right side is your compression adjustment. So all the way counterclockwise is going to be fully plush, and then it gets firmer, and it gets to where it's fully locked out when it's over on the right side, and I would only use that setting if I were to ride the bike on the road. The shock on this bike is a RockShox Super Deluxe Select Plus RT, and it is a remarkably smooth shock, just like the fork. Because of the weight of the e-bike, the bike just stays glued to the trail. And I know I'm talking more about the ride quality at this point, but it's worth mentioning now that with the shock being so smooth and so plush, and with a bike being 55 pounds, the bike just, it does not bounce up like other bikes do. So um, you really feel the, the plushness of the shock. You really feel the tire being glued to the trail, but I'll get more into the ride quality. Let's finish looking at the components of this bike. This bike comes with a SRAM Eagle drivetrain. So it's got a SRAM SX rear derailleur and the cassette is the SRAM Eagle 11 to 50. It's not the new 11 to 51, but I didn't even come close to using the 50 on this bike. Even the steepest trails in the mountains, because it has a motor on it, I just did not need that big of a gear range. Now I'll just say when I was riding the bike, I did feel like I needed to maintain my normal cadence. I did not want to stress the motor. I, I kind of felt like if I was in a really slow cadence, relying on the motor, that I could almost feel the motor straining. I don't know if that's true, but for this bike, again, when I rode it, I just kept shifting as if I were on a normal bike to keep my normal cadence, which is somewhere between 75 and 95 RPM. This bike comes with SRAM Guide RE brakes. And I'll say that these are the first guide brakes that I've used that I've really liked. I had a pair of guide brakes on a Giant Trance 29 that to me was the weak link of that bike. Not so with these brakes. They have the adjustment knob so you can adjust the lever. But I was really impressed with the power and the modulation. The guide brakes that I used before had a real spongy feel that I could not tune out even by bleeding the brakes. Uh, these have felt really good. And a lot of the power comes from the 200 mil rotors that are not only on the front, but also on the back of the bike. So again, great power, great modulation, really decent lever feel for guide brakes. The dropper post on this bike is a KS Lev. One of my favorite dropper posts, probably the smoothest dropper post that I've ever used. Now this bike is a medium and the dropper post is only 125 millimeters. The small RIP E9 comes with a 100 millimeter dropper post and the large comes with a 150. And because of the way this frame is designed, they just can't put a really long dropper post. It wasn't a huge deal, but I did not get a chance to take this bike on super gnarly rugged terrain where I'd have the post slammed all the way down and I'm way behind the saddle, which I've done on my Enduro bike. So that is a little bit of a limitation again from the frame design, but I don't think it's gonna be a big deal for a lot of people. The cockpit of this bike feels spot on. It's got a race face bar and stem. The stem is about a 50 and the bar width is 780. Really good bar width, really good rise, not too wide, not too narrow. I felt like it put my hands and body in a good position 
not only on mountain trails, but also cross country trails. I didn't feel like the bar was too low or too high and descending trails in the mountains. I felt like when I got out of the saddle, it, again, it just put my body in a really nice position for descending. And as with other Niner saddles, I really like this saddle. I like the anatomical cutout. It's a really comfortable saddle, even for long rides. I think I mentioned in my first look video of this bike that this one does not have Niner's CVA suspension, which gives a firm pedaling platform when you put pressure on the pedals. But since it's an e-bike and the power delivery is really smooth from the motor, you don't really need that. And the motor is a Bosch Performance Line CX, and this is your charge port. So this bike, I think from zero to fully charged probably took me about two and a half hours. Actually quicker charging than I would have expected for a bike with a battery this large. So I'm gonna remove the cover and show you the battery. So this bike actually comes with a set of keys and what you do to get the battery out, first of all, you've gotta remove this cover. There's a little lever you just push up here and then you slide the cu cover up maybe, I don't know, half an inch. And then you use the key to remove the battery. And the reason that you do that is if you were to like leave the bike locked up on your bike rack or locked up somewhere, you don't want someone to take these batteries, which are really expensive. So what you do is you just insert the key, turn it, the battery will pop out a little bit. And then to get it all the way out, there's a little lever you just push down and the battery comes out. So that's the battery. Now, what I would do when I transported this bike on trip, so when I was on the interstate for a long period of time, I would take the battery out so that I didn't have so much weight on the bike rack. Also, when I put this bike in a stand, I removed the battery. So I, again, I didn't have too much weight on my stand because with the battery, the entire bike is 55 pounds. And by the way, you can also charge the battery by plugging the charger into the battery itself, not just the bike. So you have two ways of charging the battery. To put the battery back in, it's just the opposite. You put the bottom in first, and then you kind of, you actually have to turn the key to get the battery back in. So you turn the key, let it go, and then just pull it in with your fingers and that will engage that little lever. And then of course you wanna put the cover back on. The cover's got two little slots here and then you would just put those on these little pegs sticking out of the bottom of the bike and then push the lever down and the cover's back on. Now, when I was riding the bike, I did not have the battery, you know, bouncing around or making any kind of noises. It's in there solid. I did ride this bike through creeks. I did not have any issue with, you know, water getting on the battery. To power this bike on, on the Bosch head unit, you tap the power button on the top. And then initially it'll be in the off setting. And then to go to the different power modes, you would tap the plus button. So Eco is the lowest, and then you've got Tour, you've got EMTB, and then you've got Turbo. Now, when I rode this bike, I wanted to get the most out of the power, so I kept it in either Turbo or EMTB. EMTB is more of an intelligent mode, so if you put a little power, it'll give you smaller amounts of power, and then if you're putting more power down, it'll give you more power. A lot of times, I just left it in Turbo. Now, I will say, when you leave it in Turbo mode, you've gotta be careful because the bike will keep going about a split second longer after you stop pedaling. So you can come into a corner kind of fast, and if you're pedaling till the last split second, you can come into the corner faster than you would think, and so you gotta be careful about that. But it is nice that you have a range indicator. So there in turbo, it says 38. If I go down to eco, it says 78 miles. And that, of course, will change depending on if you're on a steep climb or going downhill. You can fit a full-size water bottle on this frame. It is tight, and the top of the water bottle can touch underneath the down tube there, but it's nice that you can get a full-size water bottle. One of my favorite things about the new Niner bikes is the sag meter. So all you do is you set the sag based on where the line of this bearing cap touches the 30% line. So it's really easy to set your sag on these bikes. Something that I did not expect, and again, this is my first e-bike, but when you pedal the cranks backwards, the chain doesn't move, which caused lubing the chain to be a little bit of an issue. Normally what I do is I'll just spin my pedals backwards and I'll hold the bottle of lube over the chain and drip lube on it. That is slightly annoying, but I think it's just inherent in e-bikes. The last component spec that I'll talk about before I talk about the ride quality more is the tires and the wheels. So this bike comes with a Maxxis Minion DHF up front, which has a ton 
of grip. It is a 29 by 2.5. The rear tire is a Maxxis Aggressor and it also is a 2.5. This tire, just like the front, has a ton of grip, not only for climbing, but also for cornering. And this bike comes with stands flow wheels. Some of my favorite tubeless alloy wheels, they're wide, so they give the tire a nice width, nice stability. And I'll say that this is probably the first mountain bike in 15 years or more that I did not convert to tubeless. So because it was a demo, I honestly just didn't bother taking out the tubes and putting stands fluid in, but I do not have an issue with flats. I did not feel like the tire was too harsh. Again, because there's so much weight on the bike, the bike just stays glued and planted to the ground. I didn't feel like I needed that tire compliance that you get by taking out the tubes and converting them to tubeless. But the option is there if you wanted to do it. The bike comes with valve stems, so you can easily just pull out the tubes, put in your sealant and the valve stems, and you're good to go with tubeless, which is probably what I would have done if this were my bike, mainly for the flat protection. So getting a flat on the trail really sucks, but fortunately that did not happen. I'll go ahead and discuss more of the ride quality of this bike. So I've alluded to the fact of this bike feeling planted to the ground. And I was honestly pretty blown away by the ride quality of this bike. I expected this thing to feel sluggish on the trail. I expected it to be hard to get around the corners, but the weight of this bike is so low with the motor and the battery being low that it felt like this bike was on rails. It felt like the bike was in a little groove of the trail and it would not come out of that groove you could lean the bike over. The tires gave plenty of grip. I did not expect the bike to be so much fun on cross country trails. I could get this bike up to speed on a cross country trail, hit the corners a whole lot faster than I thought I would be able to and carry speed out of the corner faster than I thought. And it really made for a fun riding experience. And of course, riding this bike in the mountains was an absolute blast. It just absolutely motors up the climbs. And then coming downhill, that's where, again, the bike surprised me. It's a little different riding experience because you cannot hop over logs or you know, really flick the bike around. But because the bike felt so planted and so stable, it descended better than I anticipated. Niners seem to have really done their homework with the geometry of this bike because it felt not only dialed in the mountains, but also dialed for cross country trails. So this bike has a 65 degree head angle in the high position and a 64 and a half degree head angle in the low position, which I felt was really good. Like I didn't feel like the bike was too sluggish or I didn't feel like it was twitchy by any means. So you can change the position of the shock and again, change it from a high to a low setting. I did not bother doing that. I just kept the bike like it came from Niner. And again, on the cross country trails, it still felt plenty agile. And then up in the mountains, you know, the bike felt like I could maneuver around on the trail as best I could for a 55 and a half pound bike, but it did not feel twitchy. I do want to mention that when riding this bike, it's supposed to top out at 20 miles per hour. The motor, according to the speedometer, will start to taper down at about 18, 18 and a half miles an hour. And then once you hit 20 miles an hour, you don't get any power from the motor. You're all on your own as far as pedaling. Now I did feel like the speedometer was off a little bit. It's almost like the circumference of the wheel wasn't programmed correctly into the head unit because when I use my Garmin GPS, I felt like the speedometer on this bike was reading about one to one and a half miles per hour too high. I looked up online to see if I could adjust the wheel circumference of the Bosch head unit and I, I couldn't figure out how to do it. Maybe that's by design, so people don't program in a totally wrong wheel circumference and make the bike go faster than it's supposed to as a class one e-mountain bike, which is 20 miles per hour. So that's gonna wrap up this complete review of the Niner Rip E9. Like I said earlier, I didn't miss the carbon frame. I didn't miss the really high-end component specs like SRAM XO. The shifting has been spot on, by the way, on this bike. Did not have a drop chain, did not have a miss shift. I like the guide brakes, which surprised me, and the suspension on this bike was super plush, super smooth, felt like it was just dialed. And so again, I feel like Niner did a really good job specking this bike. You don't need the super high-end components and carbon frame for a bike that has a motor. Would I like a bike that's 10 pounds lighter? Yeah, I mean, it would have made it a little more agile on the trails, maybe be able to hop over logs like I do on my traditional bikes. But for the fun factor, 
Uh, this bike was perfect for what I wanted to use it for. So I know a lot of you will have questions and comments that you'll want to drop below because e-bikes are very polarizing, I found out by doing this series. And in fact, I'm going to wrap up this series with a video where I do the pros and cons of owning an e-bike. So if you're interested in that, check out my channel. That'll be posting in a week or two. And I'll catch you in the next video. Thanks for watching.